Hello. Earlier this lesson, we talked about electric current. Now, let's look at a property called magnets, magnetism, magnetic fields, and how a magnetic field is related to electric current. Now, what is the story of magnets? Who discovered magnets? The ancient Greeks, originally those near the city of Magnesia, and also the early Chinese knew about the strange rare stone called lodestone, lodestone with the power of attracting iron. Now this property later came to be known as the magnetic property. Now a steel needle soaked with lodestone became magnetic as well. And about 1,000 years ago, the Chinese found that such a needle, when freely suspended, pointed north-south. That is an important property of magnets. Now, people play with magnets, children play with magnets. Magnet is an integral part of many electronic circuits. So obviously, there is a close relationship between magnetism and electricity. Now, a freely suspended magnet always comes to rest in the north-south direction. Now, I have a freely suspended magnet here. When it comes to rest, it is always going to come to rest in the north-south direction. Now, if you disturb it, it will not come to rest in any other direction. It will always come to rest in the north-south direction. Alright. Now, here I have a magnetic compass. I don't know whether you can see this. That's a compass. And when that red needle is a magnetic needle, when it comes to rest, it always comes to rest in the north-south direction. And that is the property of magnets. There I have a, a magnetic needle, you can see. It comes to rest in the north-south direction. And here is a magnetic needle, another magnetic compass. Magnetic compass was used in the olden days, even now for navigation in order to find the direction because magnet is always true it will point to north south the end pointing north is called the north pole so this is the north pole of the magnetic needle and the end pointing south is called the south pole a magnet has a north pole and a south pole. I'm sure you can see written on this magnet. A magnet has a north pole. This is the north pole and this is the south pole. So if I freely suspend it, this will always point north and this will always point south. All right. Now the North Pole and South Pole of a magnet are similar to the positive and negative charges in electricity. Now the only difference is, in electricity, the positive and negative charges are separate units. You can get them separately, whereas in a magnet, the North Pole and South Pole now what happens if I break this magnet into two? If I break this into two, it will be two magnets with a North Pole, each with a North Pole and a South Pole. What happens if I break this magnet into a million pieces? Well, if I break this into a million pieces, each piece will be a magnet with a North Pole and a South Pole. Well, you cannot separate a North Pole from a South Pole.
That is the difference between magnetic poles and electric charges. Now, materials that are attracted by a magnet are called magnetic materials. Now, what are some magnetic materials? You can see here, uh, I, I have taken a paper clip onto the magnet. You can see the paper clip is made of a magnetic material. What are some of the magnetic materials that you know? Iron is a magnetic material. Cobalt is a magnetic material. Is that right? Okay. Now, how about the interaction between magnetic poles? How do magnetic poles interact? Now, here I have a magnetic compass. Now, what happens when I bring one end of another magnet close to it? Now, see what happens. Well, now, this is the south pole of the magnet I'm bringing close to the north pole. Now, let's see. Now, when I take it closer to the north pole, that's the north pole, it goes away. And the south pole, now, this is the north pole, this is the south pole. Now, what does the north pole and the south pole do? I have the south pole, you can read it. This is the south pole of the magnet. I'm taking it to the south pole of the compass. It is attracting. Now, if I move the south pole, now watch, I'm going to reverse the magnet now. I'm going to bring the north pole, see what happens. You can see when I bring the north pole, that north pole is going to go away and I now got the magnetic compass reversed. You see? Let me do it again. There you are. So each time I reverse the magnet, the compass needle reverses. That means a north pole will attract a south pole and a north pole will repel a north pole. Now, just like electric charges, you know that in electric charges, like charges repel and unlike charges attract. So, in magnetism, like poles will repel, a north pole will repel a north pole, a south pole will repel a south pole. Now, if you have a magnet, that's the north pole and that is the south pole. And if I keep a magnetic needle here, if it hit this north pole, what will it do? It will be deflected away. Whereas the south pole will be attracted. The unlike poles attract. A north pole attracts a south pole. There you are. The south pole will be attracted to the north pole. While the north pole will be repelled away from a north pole, the South Pole will be attracted to the North Pole. Now, but unlike electric charges, magnetic poles do not exist freely. I told you, magnetic poles can only exist in pairs. A North Pole and a South Pole always come together. You cannot separate a North Pole from a South Pole. If a magnet is divided into many thousands of small pieces, each piece will still be a magnet with a North Pole and a South Pole. The smallest part of a magnet consists of a single North Pole and a single South Pole. Now, if I take this magnet and break it into millions of pieces, what will be the smallest I can reach? The smallest piece will be that contains a North Pole and a South Pole. Now, such a small magnet is actually called a magnetic dipole. What does die stand for? Die stands for two. A magnetic dipole, a minute magnet that contains two poles. All magnetic materials are made up of magnetic dipoles. Now, all magnetic materials, iron, nickel, cobalt, and so on, 
are all made of the magnetic dipoles. That is why they can be made into magnets. Now, you remember we discussed the electric field. What is the meaning of an electric field, if you recall? Electric field, due to an electric charge, is a space around the electric charge where it will exert force on other charges. In the same way, a magnet has a magnetic field around it. This magnet has a magnetic field around it. Now, what is that magnetic field? The magnetic field of a magnet is the region around the magnet where it will exert force on other magnets. Now, if I place this compass needle anywhere, you can see if I move it around, let me see if I can move it away from my if I move the compass around, why is the compass moving? See that? Because this magnet, I'm going to call this the bar magnet. Now, the compass needle is placed in the magnetic field of the bar magnet. And that's the reason why, you see, it experiences a force. And I move it around, the force changes and the orientation of the magnetic needle changes. You see that? As I move it from one end of the magnet to the other end, watch what happens to the compass. Its orientation changes. Now, it means there is a magnetic field around this magnet. So how will you define a magnetic field? A magnetic field is a three-dimensional space around a magnet where it exerts force on other magnets. A magnetic field around a magnet can be studied by using the concept of field lines. I'm sure you remember the concept of field lines we used in electricity. A field line in electricity is the path taken by a unit test charge. What is the unit test charge? In electricity, we use the unit test charge as a unit positive charge. In the same way, in magnetism, we need to take a test charge. What is going to be our test charge? Is it going to be a positive charge? I mean, is it going to be well, in magnetism, what is going to be a test pole, not a test charge? In electricity, we use a test charge. In magnetism, we use a test pole. Now, what is going to be our test pole? Is it going to be a unit north pole or a unit south pole? Now, remember, you cannot actually isolate a north pole or a south pole. So this is something that you call to visualize. Now, the standard pole for magnetism is a unit north pole. That means, what is then a field line? If I have a magnet, and if I keep a unit north pole here, what will be the path it is going to take? is going to move away from, well, this is the North Pole here. If I keep a test North Pole here, it will move away from the North Pole of this magnet and towards the South Pole. You see, that will be a field line. I can construct any number of field lines that way. So what is actually a field line? A field line is the path taken by a test pole placed near a magnet. And what is our test pole? The standard test pole in magnetism is a unit north pole. So if I want to trace out field lines of this magnet, what all I need to do is place the test charge anywhere and trace the path taken by that test charge. The path followed by that test charge will be 
the field lines of the magnet. All right. Now, a unit north pole placed near a bar magnet moves away from its north pole and towards the south pole. In fact, if this is my bar magnet, well, this is the same as the magnet I just showed you. You can see the north, this is the north, this is the south, just like uh, I have drawn there. If I keep a test pole, a unit north pole here, it will move away from it and towards the south pole. And all these, if you keep a unit test pole here, it will move away from the north and towards the south. And you can see we can construct any number of field lines. And the field lines then represent the, elect the magnetic field of that magnet. Now, let me see if I can demonstrate the concept of a magnetic field. Now, can you see I have spread some iron filings? They are fine iron powder. And see what happens. See if I can get up there. Now, here you have a spread of iron powder. What I'm going to do is, I'm going to place a bar magnet above it and see if you can... Now, is there any change that you can actually see in the orientation of these uh, iron pieces? Now, look at the way, look at the way these iron filings have arranged themselves. Now, what they have done is, they've traced out a pattern of magnetic field. That means, they have traced out, if you place a unit test pole, the path they will take has been traced out. Now, doesn't it look beautiful? Well, I think so. I don't know how well it is going to be recorded. All right, this is a good illustration of how a magnetic field looks like. Okay, so what is a field line? A field line is the part taken by a unit test charge, and the field lines define uh, a magnetic field. Now, you can see if... Uh, this is a magnet. If I place a unit test charge here, it will move in that direction. And if I place a unit test charge here, it will move in that direction. And I can trace out any number of field lines and that will be a good representation of the magnetic field. So look at the magnetic field of a bar magnet. Magnetic field lines originate, look at that, they originate at the North Pole. Is that right? You can represent them by drawing arrows. They originate at the North Poles and terminate at the South Pole. And magnetic field lines that describe a magnetic field are similar to the electric field lines that we did earlier to describe an electric field. The magnetic field lines of a bar magnet can be traced out with the use of a compass like this. We can actually trace out using a compass and looking at the orientation of the compass as you move it around, you can trace out the field lines. All right, let's see if I can uh, show that to you on... A now here I have a bar magnet. This is the North Pole, the Red, and the South Pole, and here I have a magnetic compass. The Red is the North Pole. Now, if I can move it around, the path it will take will describe a field line. I'm going to show you a few field lines. I can use my mouse and look at the way there. That is a field line. In other words, this 
says that a North Pole placed here will go that way and someday it will come back to the South Pole. If I keep the North Pole, it comes here, let's see what happens there. I can take it over here and look at the field lines there. So, if I place the compass here, it will move there. That is, so see, this is the North Pole. So, the field lines originate at the North Pole and terminate at the South Pole. I can draw any number of field lines. Now, draw it here. That's the one. And if I draw it there, another one. I can draw a third line. I can actually draw any number of field lines and that represents the magnetic field of that bar magnet. Right? There you are. So we can actually construct the magnetic field due to a bar magnet by using a compass needle like this. And this represents the path a unit test charge will take when placed around the magnet. All right. Let's move on. So now you understand the concept of a magnetic field. Now, a magnetic field can be produced by an electric current. That means Magnetism and electricity are closely linked. There is some good relationship there. Now, if a compass needle is kept below a conducting wire that carries an electric current, the compass needle will deflect. Now, you know that the deflection of a compass needle. Now, this compass needle deflects. Now, when will it deflect? Tell me, what is the reason for the deflection of the compass needle? The compass needle deflects well in the presence of a magnet. Now, in the presence of a magnet means in, in a magnetic field. See, this magnet has a magnetic field. And when I bring this magnet close to the compass needle, it is the magnetic field due to this magnet that deflects the compass needle. See that? The compass needle deflects because of the magnetic field of this magnet. Now, in the same way, if I keep a wire carrying a current, the current flowing in the wire will produce a deflection on the magnetic needle. Now, I'm trying to see if I can demonstrate that to you. Now, this is something you need to watch very carefully to observe. I have a wire. I'm going to allow a current to flow through it. There's no current now. Now, what's the magnetic needle there? Now, when I allow the current to flow in the wire, see if the magnetic needle is moving. Can you see it? I can see it. Well, there is, yes, a, a very small movement. It is not a very big movement, you can see, because the current is very weak. You can see there. There you are. There you are. So, when I, when I put the current on, when I connect this to the battery, I don't want to put the current for a long time. You can see the, when the current is on, the, yes. Now, when the current flows in one direction, the magnetic needle moves one way. If the current is reversed, it will move the other way. Now, you can see there, I'm trying to see what happens. Can you see this end is moving up there? Is that right? Okay. I'm going to change the direction of the current and see what happens now. I'm trying there to change the direction. All right. 
Now, look what happens now. That end is actually moving down now. There you are. So, a current in a conductor will produce a magnetic field and the direction of the field lines. Now remember, a field, an electric field or a magnetic field has a direction. The direction of the magnetic field depends on the direction of the current. Well, so this is the example I was showing you. If you allow a current to flow through this wire, the north pole will deflect this way and the south pole deflects the other way. And if you reverse the current, the deflection direction will also reverse. If the current carrying wire is made in the form of a coil called a solenoid. Now, if the current carrying conductor is now in, in a form like this, this is a solenoid. Now, if I pass current through this solenoid, this solenoid will behave exactly like a bar magnet. So, you can see, magnetic field can be caused by an electric current. When an electric current flows through a coil of wire, that coil of wire behaves like a magnet. In fact, that has wide applications. A current carrying solenoid is called an electromagnet. Electromagnets are used widely in constructing electric bells. They are used in your videos and televisions. So very widely used electromagnets. Uh, this is an electromagnet, a current carrying coil. Now look at and compare the electric field lines. The electric field lines produced by current in a solenoid is exactly the same as the electric field lines of a bar magnet. Now, such electromagnets are used as switches and relays in many electrical circuits such as VCRs, automobile, the automobile starters, signaling devices, doorbells and many 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 applications. Let's now look at the principle of an electric motor. What does a motor do? It takes electrical energy and converts into rotational energy. Is that right? That's what an electric motor do. Now the working of an electric motor is the result of interaction between two magnetic fields. Now, if you keep a current carrying coil inside a magnetic field, two magnetic fields are going to interact and we will see the result of that interaction. Now, place a current carrying conductor between the pole pieces of a strong magnet. Now, let me see if I could show that to you and you can see what the result will be. What I have done here is to arrange a very strong magnet. You see, this is a magnet with the North Pole and South Pole. Now, I'm going to keep a wire and I'm going to allow a current to flow in that wire. Now, I want you to watch what happens to the wire. Now, this end of the wire, I'm going to connect to a battery so that a current flows in it. Now, watch what happens to the wire. What happened? Tell me what happened. Well, actually, the wire experiences a force and it gets pulled inside. It gets pulled inside. Now watch it again. It's not, you can't actually see very well, but it's quite clear. Yes. When I connect it to the battery, I don't keep it connected a long time because the battery drives a big current and the wire will get very hot. So there, when the current flows in the wire, the, the wire gets pulled inside. 
See what happens when I change the direction of the current. I'm going to change the direction of the current and see now what happens. Now the wire gets pulled out. See that? There you are. So a current carrying a current carrying wire placed inside a magnetic field experiences a force and as a result of the force it will move and this is the principle of electric motor well let's see more about it all right give me a second i'll be with you Now, I have illustrated that with a diagram here. If this is the north pole of a magnet, that's the south pole, and you allow a current to flow in that wire, the wire will either move up or down depending on the direction of the current. So a magnetic field produced by the current. Now, what is actually happening here? There is a magnetic field produced by the magnet, and there is a magnetic field produced by the current in the wire. Now these two magnetic fields interact and they produce the force. It is the interaction between the two magnetic fields. You know that a, a like poles will attract and unlike poles will repel. So it is like two magnets brought together. When there are two magnets brought together, there will be a force. So the magnetic field due to the current in the wire and the magnetic field due to this magnet, they interact creating a force on the wire. Now, this is exactly what I did. This is a very strong magnet and if you allow a current to flow in it, now this is, there is no current. When you allow a current to flow in it, the, have you seen it has moved up? From this position, it has moved up. And what happens if you reverse the direction of the current? When the current is turned on, the wire moves up. Now, if the direction of the current is reversed, what will happen? It will move down. So look at the positions of the wire. There is no current. When the current is turned on, the wire moves up. The current is turned off, the wire moves down. All right. Now, we can use this principle to construct a simple electric motor. Now, if a current is allowed to pass through a coil of wire placed between the pole pieces of a magnet, the coil will rotate. Now, what is a coil of wire? Let me see if I can show you a coil of wire. Now, if I, I take a frame like this and wind a wire, can you see what I'm doing? Now, here, I can wind it a number of times. I don't have enough length on this, so I just have one winding. Now, here I have a coil of wire wound on a wooden frame. Now, if I place this in a magnetic field and pass a current, now one thing you understand is that when the current is towards you, if the force is upward, when the current is towards me, the force will be downward. So, what happens when this coil is placed in a magnetic field and I allow a current to flow in this coil. I want you to understand when I connect this to a battery, the battery will send current. On the right side, the current will be towards you, right? And the current will flow like this, will come there. And on the left side, the current will be towards me. So, when this is in the magnetic field, if the right side experiences a force upward, the left side will experience a force downward, what happens? The coil will rotate. And this is the principle of an electric motor. 
You see, as the current flows, the side of the coil that carries current towards you will move up, and the side that carries current towards me will move down. You can see the coil will start rotating. And that is the principle of an electric motor. I've illustrated it like this here. This is the coil of wire, and here you have a magnet, the North Pole and the South Pole. And when you connect this to a power source, a battery, you can see the current flows, I'm going to say, into the board, because I have a screen on a board. Or I can say into the screen here, and out of the screen on the other side. You see, as the current flows into the screen there, the force will be upward, and as the current flows out of the screen, the force will be downward. What happens? The coil will rotate. That's right. So the current flows that way into the screen on the right side, and out of the screen on the left side. As the current in each arm of the coil is in the opposite direction, the forces are also opposite. Now, this is the principle used for constructing an electric motor. So, because the forces are opposite, the coil will rotate. Now, all electrical motors, including the fans, they are all uh, constructed using this principle. And I have uh, given a diagram of what that actually looks like. If this is the coil, this is the magnet, and when you connect the system to a power, the coil will rotate. The coil is called the armature. And of course there are many other devices in the construction of an electric motor to make sure that the rotation is continuous. Alright, what is the generator effect? Well, if an electric current flowing in a conductor produces motion on it when placed in the magnetic field. Now the question you can ask is, is the reverse process, is, is, is the reverse process will work? In other words, what is the reverse process? If I have a magnet, now if I have a magnet, and if I place a conductor inside here and move it, will the movement of the conductor generate an electric current in the conductor? You see, what is the motor effect? The motor effect is you place a conductor inside a magnetic field and pass a current in it, the conductor will either move out or in. That's the, that's the motor effect. Now what is the reverse process? If I place a conductor in a magnetic field and move it, I'm going to move it, will that produce an electric current? Well, what do you think? Well, let me see if I can uh, demonstrate that to you. I'm trying to demonstrate the, these very simple principles. All right, I want you to watch this. First of all, let me tell you what this is. I have a, a big coil of wire here. It's a solenoid. It is connected to an electrical meter. In other words, if current flows in this coil, the meter will show a deflection. Now, what is it that we are trying to say? If I place this coil, uh, this one, the, the bottom one, or any of those. If I place this coil in a magnetic field and move the coil, will the motion of the coil generate an electric current? Now what I'm going to do is, I'm going to keep a magnet close by there, and because the magnet is a little, the coil, I don't want to move it on the right. See, I'm going to bring a magnet, look at this. This is a magnet. I'm going to move the magnet. Instead of moving the coil, I'm going to move the magnet. You see what happens. When the magnet is moved, a current flows in the coil. The 
Deflection of the pointer tells me that a current is flowing in the coil. You see? So, this is the reverse effect of the motor effect. And this effect is called the generator effect. So, what is the generator effect? The generator effect is you place a coil of wire in a magnetic field and either move the magnet or move the coil the relative motion between the coil and the magnet will generate an electric current and this is the principle of an electric generator in fact all the electricity that is generated and distributed for our use is produced like this you have a coil of wire and that wire is kept in a magnetic field. Now you either move the coil or move the magnetic field and that motion, the relative motion, will generate an electric current. So this is the opposite effect of the motor effect. The generator effect demonstrates that a voltage and hence a current can be generated by plunging a coil of wire into and out of a magnetic field. You see? By plunging a coil of wire into and out of a magnetic field. By creating a relative motion between a coil of wire and a magnet. Conversely, if a magnet is plunged into and out of a coil of wire, that's what we actually did. We used a magnet and we plunged a magnet into and out. Is that right? We are plunging a magnet into and out. Now, one thing I would like you to notice. When I move the magnet away, the deflection is on one side. And when I bring the magnet closer, the deflection is the opposite side. What that means is... Depending on the direction of motion, the direction of current will change. When I bring the magnet closer, if the current is from A to B, when I take the magnet away, the current is from B to A. You see, the direction of the current changes. Such a current is called an alternating current. You see, if you have a conductor, and you produce a current in it that flows from A to B when the magnet is brought towards it and then B to A when the magnet is taken away. The direction of current alternates. You have an alternating current. So what I have been generating here in this case is an alternating current. You see? The direction of the current when I move the magnet away is in one direction. When the magnet is brought closer, the direction is opposite. Now, the current flowing in the coil is called induced current. The current is induced in it due to the relative motion between the magnet and the coil. Now, this is an illustration of exactly what I did. When the magnet in the figure is moves towards or away from the coil. Now this is the magnet. If I move that magnet away or towards the coil, the, the meter will show a deflection. Alright? We just uh, saw that. Now this is another illustration of that. This is the coil of wire. Um, Plunging the magnet into and out of it. So you should know that when the magnet is plunged into the coil, if the current is in one direction. Now here, there is no motion. Now that means the magnet is stationary. When you plunge the magnet into the coil, if the current is in one direction, when the magnet is taken away, the current will be in the opposite direction. The induced current is caused by changing the magnetic field at the coil. When the magnet is stationary, there is no induced current. 
That means induced current is produced only when there is relative motion between the two. That means when the electric and when the magnetic field is changing. When the magnet moves towards the coil, the magnetic field at the coil is increasing. And when the magnet is pulled away, the magnetic field is decreasing. So it is this increasing or decreasing magnetic fields that are responsible for the induced current. So when the coil is moved away, when the coil is withdrawn, the magnetic field at the coil decreases and an induced current flows in the opposite direction. Very important to understand that. When the magnetic field increases, if the current flows in one direction, when the magnetic field decreases, the current flows in the opposite direction. The same results can be produced by keeping the magnet stationary and moving the coil. So either way, we can produce the same result. See, I can probably show you an illustration of this. Now here I have the same setup. Watch this. Now a magnet is being introduced in the coil. There you have the current. Now what's the direction of the current? When the magnet is introduced, the direction is that way. When it is withdrawn, it is opposite. So, watch it again. Alright, withdrawn, one direction. When you introduced, withdrawn. Alright. Introduced that way, withdrawn that way. So when there is relative motion, there you are. The direction of the current is opposite depending on the direction of motion of the magnet. Alright, let's uh, go on. Now, we talked about that. Now, this is the principle of an electric generator. Let's see if I can show you the working of an electric generator. the working of a generator now what you see here is a coil of wire is being rotated inside a magnetic field so when the coil of wire is rotated inside the magnetic field what happens well when the coil I want you to watch the direction when the coil moves down watch this the direction of current is that way and what happens when the coil moves up? The direction changes. So when the coil moves down, the direction of current is that way. And when that part moves up, the direction changes. So every time the coil moves up, if the direction is one way, when the coil moves down, the direction is the other way. Now, this is the illustration of that. How does the current change? The induced current is never steady. It continuously changes direction. All right? If I increase the rate of rotation, let me increase the rate of rotation. You can see there. Increasing the rate of rotation will increase the induced current. You can see the current is now much greater. Now, the number of times the number of times the direction of current changes per second is called the frequency of an alternating current. In fact, all the currents that we use at home, in offices, in college, are all like this. They are alternating current. And there is a frequency for the alternating current. What does frequency mean? The number of times the direction changes per second. The frequency of the current we used here is 60 hertz. You know what a hertz is? Hertz per second. In other words, 
the coil rotates 60 times a second, making the direction of the current to change back and forth 60 times a second. That is what it means. All right, let's move on. Now, the current induced in a coil like that is proportional to the number of turns in the coil. If you increase the number of turns in the coil, the induced current will increase. And the strength of the magnetic field, if you use a very strong magnet, the induced current will be greater. And the rate at which the magnetic field of the coil changes, the rate of rotation, you rotate the coil faster, the induced current will be greater, as I showed you. Now, an electric generator is a device that converts mechanical energy into electrical energy. You see, in an electrical generator, we provide the rotation. We need extra external energy. In fact, if you go and look at a big generating plant, in Florida, we have a number of coal-burning generating plants. Now, the energy to turn the coil is produced by burning coil, by boiling water and producing the steam. And it is the steam that gets injected into what are called turbines. It's the turbines that contains the coil. And that coil is made to turn by injecting that steam. So, mechanical energy is converted to electrical energy. A coil of wire of several thousand turns is called a turbine. It is made to rotate in a very strong magnetic field, causing the magnetic field at the coil to change continuously. There, this is an example of a turbine. This is a great big coil of wire which is made to rotate in a magnetic field. Now, where does the energy for rotation come from? Either from nuclear energy, or burning coil, or from solar energy, or any other source. Now, this continuously changing magnetic field induces a current to flow in the coil. Now, the induced voltage is proportional to the number of turns of the coil and how fast it is turning. We talked about this. Now, here are examples of turbine. The coil is turned by energy obtained by burning coal, burning oil, or nuclear energy, and so on. We can also use renewable energy such as water, wind and solar energy to turn the turbine. All these are external sources of energy which are used to turn the turbine to produce electrical energy. What is the difference between an alternating current and a direct current? Now, the generator we just saw produces an alternating current. Whereas a battery produces a direct current. The current we get from a battery is a direct current. It always flows from the positive of the battery to the negative. The direction doesn't change. So DC, DC stands for direct current. Don't call it DC current. It is a DC. DC means direct current. Flows only in one direction. In other words, it always remains steady along in one direction. Now, electricity is supplied commercially by, in produ by producing, well, I showed you the generators. Electricity produced by those kind of generators are alternating current. You understand why the direction changes alternating. Because when the coil, when the part of the coil rotates up, has a current flowing from A to B. When it rotates down, the current flows from B to A. The AC used in the US changed the direction of flow 60 times a second. I showed you that. And the current will look like this. Its direction is continuously changing. So this is an alternating current. This is a direct current.
All right. The, the distinction is a direct current remains steady in the same direction always, whereas an alternating current changes direction continuously and uh, very often the direction changes 60 times a second for the current we actually use. Now since AC is a continuously changing current, the magnetic field it produces is also changing. That means the changing magnetic field of an AC can be used to induce current in other coils. You see? Because an induced current is produced by a changing magnetic field. Because a changing magnetic field induces a voltage in the coil of an AC flowing in one coil can induce an AC in another coil. Now, if I have one coil of wire here that has an AC in it, that can induce current in another coil. Now, this is the principle of a transformer. When an AC passes through a coil wound on an iron core, an, an AC is induced in another coil wound on the same core. You see, a current flowing in one coil of wire can induce a current in another coil of wire. Now, this is the principle of a transformer. Do you know what a transformer is? Have you seen one? We have transformers all over. All right. What is a transformer? If uh, I have a second, I can show you a demonstration. Now, here I have an electromagnet. You can see a coil of wire, and I have connected this to an alternating current. Now, I also have an electric bulb here, and you know that bulb is connected to this coil. There is no current in this coil, but see what happens when I insert this coil into here. You see, if you watch anything to the bulb, all right, what is happening to the bulb? It is lighting up. Now, where did this coil get current from? You see, this coil is not connected to any source of current. But when I introduce it in here, what happens is the changing magnetic field, now the alternating current flowing on this produces a continuously changing magnetic field. And the continuously changing magnetic field induces a current in this coil which lights up that bulb. So this is the principle of a transformer. Well, you have a transformer right outside your house. The same principle. So a transformer consists of two sets of coils of wire. Now, one carries an alternating current and that will produce an induced current in another alternating, another coil of wire. Now, there you are. Well, that is the principle of a transformer. Okay. So, what is a transformer? I just showed you how a transformer works. A transformer consists of an iron core on which two separate coils are wound. Now, this can be a transformer. Well, the ones I showed you had an iron core. I don't know you remember. The iron core is important to enhance the magnetic field. And one coil was the, uh, the one that allowed the, the current through and the other coil is the one in which the current was produced. Now the coil that you allow the alternating current to flow is called the primary coil and the coil in which the induced current is produced is called the secondary coil. So a 
transformer has two sets of coil primary coil and secondary coil primary coil is the one in which you allow the alternating current to flow and the alternating current in the primary coil will produce an alternating or changing magnetic field and that changing magnetic field will induce a current in the secondary coil. So the coils are called primary and secondary. When an AC is allowed to pass through the primary coil, it's changing magnetic field. Remember, an induced current is produced by a changing magnetic field. An AC that passes through the primary produces a changing magnetic field. Why? Because an alternating current is continuously changing. Therefore, the magnetic field produced by it is also continuously changing. And that changing magnetic field will induce an alternating current in the secondary coil. Now, the induced voltage in the secondary coil is controlled by the ratio of the number of turns of the coil. Now, I did not show that to you, but it's a very important information. Now, how much is the voltage or the current? Now, remember, a current is produced by a voltage. So what is actually being induced in the secondary coil is an alternating voltage. It is that voltage that then causes a current to flow. Now, the voltage induced in the secondary depends on the ratio of the number of primary turns to the number of secondary turns. You understand the meaning of ratio? We talked about it. Now, let the number of turns in the primary coil be N1 and let the number of turns in the secondary coil be N2. So, the number of primary turns is N1 and the number of secondary turns is N2. If E1 is the voltage input, well, if E1 is the voltage input in the primary and E2 is the voltage output in the secondary, then the voltage input and the voltage output are connected to the number of turns in the primary to the number of uh, turns in the secondary by this relation. E1 divided by E2 equal to N1 divided by N2. An important relationship. The primary voltage, the input voltage, divided by the secondary voltage, the output voltage, equal to the number of turns in the primary divided by the number of turns in the secondary. That means by changing the ratio of the number of turns, we can either produce a higher voltage than the input or a smaller voltage than the input. A transformer is designed to convert, this is a simple problem, a transformer is designed to convert 110 volts AC to 220 volt AC. Now, this C must read V, 220 volt AC. If the primary number of turns is 5, what should be the number of turns in the secondary? Now here you notice that you're going to input a 110 volt and we're going to output a 220 volts. The output voltage is greater than the input voltage. Now this type of a transformer is called a step-up transformer. In other words, the output we produce is greater than the input. We are stepping it up. A step-up transformer. This is a step-up transformer. All right, what, we, what are we looking for? We are looking for the number of turns in the secondary. We know the number of turns in the primary. We know the primary voltage. We know the secondary voltage. 
we know the primary number of turns, we want to find the secondary number of turns. So E1 equal to 110 volts. There you are. E1 equal to 110 volts. E2 equal to 220 volts. So this is the primary coil where you input 110 volts. And this is the secondary where we want to obtain 220 volts. The number of turns we use in the primary are 5. What should be the number of turns in the secondary? Alright, what's the relation? We want to find N2. Okay, we start with this equation. E1 divided by E2 equal to N1 divided by N2. Now, let's cross multiply. What do you get? E1 times N2 equal to E2 times N1. I hope you know how to cross multiply. It's a very basic algebra. So, E1 multiplied by N2 equal to E2 multiplied by N1. Now, what are we looking for in here? We are looking for N2, the number of turns in the secondary. So, to solve this for N2, we divide both sides by E1. Can you do that? When you divide both sides by E1, we will get N2 equal to E2 N1 divided by E1. And what all we now need to do is replace the values here. E2 equal to 220 volts, N1 equal to 5, and E1 equal to 110. And that will give you, can you simplify that and give me a value? 220 multiplied by 5 divided by 110, that will give me N2 equal to 10 turns. So, if you want to double the voltage in the secondary, you need to double the number of turns. So, tell me, if you now want to produce, say, 1,100 volts in the secondary, you are inputting 110 volts using a number of turns equal to 5. Suppose I want a 1100 volt output. What must be the number of turns? Well, I want 10 times the output. Uh, the output has to be 10 times the input. That means the secondary number of turns has to be 10 times the primary number of turns. All right. So here, the output voltage is greater than the input voltage and therefore, this transformer is what kind of a transformer? A step-up transformer. Such a transformer is called a step-up transformer. Now, for a step-up transformer, the number of turns in the secondary is greater than the number of turns in the primary. Try another one. The primary coil of a transformer has 2,000 turns and the secondary has 500 turns. If the primary input is 400 volts, what is the secondary output? I'm sure you can do this on your own. What do we have? The primary input is 400 volts. The number of turns in the primary is 200. The number of turns in the secondary is 500. We want to find the output of the secondary. What is the output voltage? Well, we start with this equation. E1 divided by E2 equal to N1 divided by N2. This is the transformer equation. It is used for all kinds of transformers. The primary input divided by the secondary output equal to the primary number of turns divided by the secondary number of turns. Now, this time, what are we looking for? We are looking for E2. Can you solve for E2 from here? Well, as we did in the previous case, we can cross multiply. We get E2 times N1. Alright, E2 times N1 
equal to E1 times N2. We want to solve for E2. Therefore, we divide both sides by N1. Dividing by N1 gives you E2 equal to E1 N2 divided by N1. And we have all those values. E1 equal to 400. N2 equal to 500. N2, uh, N1 equal to 2000. Therefore, what is E2 equal to? E2 is 100 volt. So, you notice here that the number of turns, well, the output voltage is a quarter of the input voltage. Therefore, the number of turns in the secondary will be a quarter of the number of turns in the primary. A quarter of 2000, well, wait a minute. Uh, the number of turns in the prime, the number of turns in the secondary is a quarter of the number of turns in the primary. Therefore, the secondary output will be a quarter of the primary input. A quarter of 400 is 100. So, transformer problems are actually simple. You don't even need to use the formula. You can use that symmetry to explain it. So here, the output voltage is less than the input voltage. Therefore, this transformer is a step-down transformer. You see, if you go around, there are many step-up transformers and step-down transformers. Now, in the power station where you generate power, the power is stepped up into a very high voltage, about 200,000 volt. You know why? Because when the height difference is substantial, it is easy for electric current to be transported. When electricity is transported to distant places, the potential difference is made very high so that the flow will be easier. So at the electricity generating station, you use step-up transformers to step up the voltage to very high voltage. And when it comes to distribution places, I'm sure most of you must have seen, we have substations where we get these high tension lines. What are high tension lines? High tension lines are the ones that come from electricity generating place and they carry very high voltage and they come to the distribution center where this very high voltage is stepped down to a low voltage to about 4000 volts and it is that then distributed to almost all the street corners, all the offices, where that is again stepped down to 110 volts. That is what we use at home. So, for a step-down transformer, the number of secondary turns is less than the number of primary turns. Okay, let me now give you an extra credit assignment. Now, that's a nice way to end this course, is that right? Something to do to earn some extra points. Now, the transformer that delivers power to your home is a step-down transformer. You see, the lines that reach, there are three lines if you look on the electricity pole there. That carries or that brings in 4,000 volts. And those are the lines that come from the substation. And the 4,000 volts has to be converted to 110 and 220 volts. In fact, your transformer sitting outside your home, have you seen one of those? Every home has a transformer. If you look at the electricity pole right outside your house, there is a cylindrical stuff sitting on it. And that is your transformer. And the transformer gives you actually two types of output. It gives you a 110 volts and a 220 volts, which obviously means that there must be two sets of secondary coils 
which will supply this. Is that right? I'm giving you a hint. Now, this is your transformer. You know what it is. Now, the questions I want you to answer is, how is it possible to get two outputs from the same transformer? Well, I didn't really know that I was going to ask you that question. I answered that. I hope you haven't heard it. Well, try and answer that on your own. If the primary winding has 5,000 turns, how many secondary turns will give each of the outputs? You need two outputs. You need a 110 output and a 220 output. You know that your air conditioner, washing machines, dryers, uh, I think the cooking range all works on 220 volts. And almost everything else works on 110 moles. Now draw a diagram to illustrate your answer in two. In other words, the diagram will consist of your iron core and the primary coil and the secondary coil. Label on the diagram the number of turns in each case. All right. Now this is an extra credit assignment. And those who are lagging behind in many respects, this will have uh, equal weightage as a lab. You see, it, consider, it carries a considerable amount of weight. So do this and try and earn the extra credit. Well, we have actually finished the course. Now, I hope the course has been good. You learned a lot about measurement to start with, astronomy, geology, then meteorology, the weather, and then a small lesson on electricity. We covered a lot of topics and all these are very important and very informative for your general understanding. All right, I hope you understood these concepts and I hope you enjoyed the course. The final exam is actually the, a test on this unit 5 and a small number of questions. It may be 15 or 20 questions from the rest of the course. So once again, you will have about 25 questions from unit 5 electricity and about 15 or 20 questions from the rest of the course. That will be your final. In other words, the test that you take which is called the test 5, is actually the final exam, which has a small component that carries all the course that you have done. I have selected few selected questions from the whole course, simply to test you how much of the material we done you remember. All right, thank you for doing the course, and I wish you all the best.